Elder Brandon Small. This is not the end. We get to go on from here. When you fall down, get, get back, back up. up. When you fall down, get, get back up. up. When you fall down, get back up. When you fall down, get back up. By your grace, we will. Good morning. Y'all can hear me okay? When you fall down, so I get the privilege of speaking to you on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Um, thank you. Uh, um, um, for those of you who are here for the first time or joining us for the first time, you caught us in the middle of a series entitled Get Back Up. And so you just heard the phrase, when you fall down, get back up. Um, those words ought to bring encouragement. Those words ought to bring encouragement no matter who they come from. They ought to bring encouragement whether they come from a mother, a brother, a, a, a sister, a, a coach, a teacher. But for me, um, I find something significant about being able to speak to you about what it means to get back up on Father's Day. Because for me, there's something inherently dad in those words. Um, those words coming from a father just rings a little different. And so one of my prayers this morning is, even as we talk about what it means to get back up, even for those of us who may have never heard those words come from your natural father, I'm praying this morning that as you hear those words, you will hear the Heavenly Father encouraging you. You will hear those words resting on us from heaven this morning, telling us, encouraging us to get back up. Amen? Today is also significant, and I'm humbled and privileged to get to speak to you about what it means to get back up on America's second Independence Day. Um, happy Juneteenth, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. On this day, June 19th, 1865, over 250,000 enslaved black people in Galveston, Texas were made aware, given the legal right to get back up. And so this morning, I am humbled to stand before you on this particular Sunday to talk about what it means to get back up. Amen? Amen. So if you would turn with me, we're going to look to God's word for some encouragement. Turn with me to first, I'm sorry, second Corinthians, first chapter, verses eight through 11. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses eight through 11. As you turn there, swipe there, quick story. So uh, I was walking through a house with a contractor, and, uh, and it's an old house. We walk through the house. We walk down in the basement. It's a concrete basement. We walk around the corner, and there's a small bathroom. And so he had already begun to lay some tile in, in the bathroom, and so he'd begun that first row of tile. But I'm, and that looked fine, looked fine. I'm looking at the rest of the floor, though, in the bathroom, and you can imagine it's an old house, old basement, concrete, floors all over the place. Floors all over the place. It's high in some places. It's low in some places. It's cracks. There's imperfections. There's 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 divots and dips and slopes. And I'm looking at this floor, and in my mind, it's a concern because I realize that this floor needs to be level in order for it to be all that it can be. <laughs> in order for it, in order for it to look good and feel good under someone's feet, this floor needs to be level. But I'm looking at a floor that is not level, far from it. It's all over the place. It's imperfect. And so I begin to express that concern to the contractor. And, and, I, and I wasn't mad, I wasn't angry, I wasn't, but I was serious and I was concerned. And so I began to express that concern to the contractor. And his response to me was, was, was you know, he laughed at me. He laughed at me. And, and his response was, it's okay, it's, okay. it's just no problem. He's like, it's no problem, it's no problem, don't, don't worry, don't worry, it's, it's no problem. And I, said, and I said, excuse me, he said, it's no problem, he said, it's okay, said, don't worry, don't worry. He's from Honduras, so anywhere, anyone from Honduras, forgive me if I'm butchering the accent. And so he's telling me it's no problem. He's telling me not to worry. But I'm looking at what I perceive to be a problem and what I perceive to be a real concern. But he's saying, don't worry. And so I leave, 
I get back in the car, and I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried because I don't have confidence in his confidence. Anybody ever find yourself in that position where you're looking at something that you perceive to be a problem, but there are people in your life, perhaps a person in your life that's telling you it's not a problem? But I'm looking at what looks to be a problem, and I'm concerned, and that's producing worry in my life. And when I told you not to worry, that's upsetting, isn't it? It's like I'm worried for a reason because of what I see in front of me. And someone's telling you not to worry. You see, it wasn't him that was causing concern in my life. It was the actual floor. It was the, the imperfections of the floor, the cracks and the crevices and the dips and everything that I felt like disqualified it from being all that it could be, from its potential. And how many of you know, if you're being honest, have ever done that to yourself? You look at your own inadequacies and your own shortcomings and your own faults and your own failures, and you disqualify yourself from that next thing, from being all that you can be. We do that to other people. We look at other people's faults and shortcomings and setbacks, and we disqualify them from being all that they can be. And so we're going to look at a passage of Scripture this morning, find some encouragement from it, written by a man who had a lot of shortcomings, and who had a lot of difficulty, and who went through a lot of trials, and in fact was being criticized by the people he was writing to, saying that surely someone who goes through as much as you go through, Paul, can't possibly be an apostle of Jesus. Your life is too difficult. In fact, all the suffering and the pain and everything that you go to should, should actually disqualify you from being an apostle. This was the criticism that Paul was getting from the Corinthian church, which is a church he planted and a church he loved, by the way. And so we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. So Paul is writing this. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. God, we thank you this morning. Lord, we pray that as we get into your word, you would allow your word to get into us. Amen. Um, I want to talk about this scripture in this context. He has gotten, somebody say he has gotten. He is getting. He will get us back up. He has gotten us back up. He is getting us back up. And he will get us back up. Paul begins this, this part of the letter talking about his affliction in Asia. Talking about what God has gotten him back up from. He's writing this letter to the Corinthians on his third missionary journey. Now, to put this into context, he says that when we were in Asia, we experienced affliction. We were utterly burdened beyond our strength. Anyone ever felt utterly burdened beyond your strength? Like there's just a lot that you're carrying. There's more weight than, you sh than you're strong enough to bear. He said we felt utterly burdened beyond our strength such that we despaired of life itself. We believe that we'd been given a death sentence. This is what Paul is writing. Now, to put that into context, this is coming from a man who on his first missionary journey was stoned to death. It says when he was in Lystra, people didn't like what he was saying. They stoned him. They thought he was dead, drug him out of the city, and the people that were following him gathered around him supposedly to, to mourn a man who they thought was dead. And it says that he got back up. <laughs> 
says he popped up, went on about his business. Now, understand, a stoning was not a disciplinary procedure. A stoning was an execution. It was capital punishment, all right? And so these people were good at what they did. They were good at killing people by way of stoning. And so I don't believe that they simply thought he was dead. I think there was every indication that the man was dead. They stoned him. They executed him. I believe God restored his life. God got him back up. He's gotten you up from some stuff. So Paul is talking about how God has gotten him up. That was on his first journey. His first journey. Imagine God tells you to do something, you go somewhere and you get stoned. You, you probably ain't going on the second one. But Paul went on a second one. And he goes on the second journey, and on the second journey, he finds himself beaten, flogged, dra dragged into prison in Philippi. And not only did God get him back up from that situation, he actually used it to save a bunch of other people. A bunch of prisoners, a jailer. God got him back up. The other thing that happened on his second journey was he actually planted the church that he's writing to, the church in Corinth. The Bible says that he wanted to go through Asia. Remember Asia, the place where he experienced all this affliction? The Bible says he wanted to go through Asia the second time around, but the Holy Spirit said, nope, not now, not this time, not Asia. Now, we don't know all of the affliction that happened in Asia. We don't have a record of specifically what happened in Asia. But what we do know is that it was bad enough for God to say, no, not this time. And it was bad enough that Paul, a man who was stoned and beaten and jailed, said, hey, that was bad, but Asia was really bad. So that's what we know about Asia in terms of how bad it was. How many of you know that no matter what you're going through, as bad as it seems, as bad as it feels, as painful as it may be, as sorrowful as it may be, as much as it might feel like the worst thing you've ever experienced in your life, how many of you know it ain't Asia? God is always, always saving you from something worse. Not only is he saving you from something worse, he told him don't go through Asia on the second journey. And so when you look at his route, he went up around Asia, down to Ephesus, over to Corinth, and that's when the church at Corinth was planted. Had God not saved him from Asia that second time around, this church wouldn't exist. So not only is he saving you from something, he's always saving you for something. How many of you know God is saving you from something for something? The question is, when you begin to recount what God has saved you from, your perspective changes with respect to your suffering, with respect to the situation. This is what it looks like to rejoice in our suffering because we, get, we, we sort of go from God, why am I going through this? Why am I going through that? Why am I going through that? Why am I going through that? To... God, I thank you that I'm not going through that. I thank you that I'm not going through that. I thank you that I'm not going through that. I thank you that I'm not going through that. And that, that begins to well up in your heart a gratitude toward what he's actually saving you from and a perspective to what he might be saving you for. He's gotten you up. He's gotten us up from some stuff. He got Paul up. And then he goes on to talk about his hope. He says that we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength, we wanted to die. But this was so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who does what? Raises the dead. He was speaking from experience. God had restored his life. And then he says, because of that, because he saved us from a deadly peril, we actually now put our hope in him says we set our hope on him. You know, if I, when I walk into a gas station or 7-Eleven or anywhere and I, and, I, and I get a scratch off or something like that, right? A little scratch off ticket. I get to scratching, right? And, and, and we say things like, like, like Lord, 
<laughs> we say things like, Lord, I hope, Lord, I hope you put these three apples in a row or whatever it is, right? These three bananas or monkeys, whatever they are. I hope you put these three things in a row. Guess what? That's not hope. That's not hope. That's wishful thinking. There's no basis on which you should get those three apples. Biblical hope, Paul says, we, because he delivered us, past tense, from such a deadly peril, we now, present tense, set our hope in him. Biblical hope is an expression of faith in God's promises for the future based upon his past faithfulness. And so our hope is not wishful thinking. Our hope is actually based on what we've seen him do. His word that's come to pass, and because it came to pass in the past, we believe that it will come to pass again. That's biblical hope. That's what it looks like to hope in the present. God is getting you back up getting you back up right now in this moment he's getting you back up from stuff he's getting you back up to stuff with every breath he's getting us back up he is active in this world when you know at the beginning of the world when god said let there be light and and there was light and the sun guess what you walk outside you look up in the sky what's there the sun his word never stopped being active in the earth and so he is actively, presently getting you back up. You look at a mountain climber who climbs a mountain, you don't wait till he gets to the top of the mountain to say he's climbing the mountain, no. And all the while, the entire process, he is climbing the mountain. And so it's not just that he got you back up, it's not just that he's going to get you back up, it's that he is presently, in the moment, getting you back up. He's active, he's present. This is what it looks like to set our hope in him, to engage with him daily, to pray, to worship, to read your Bible every day. This is what it looks like to, to be actively engaged, to not quit, according to Rico. Don't quit. Stay engaged. Because guess what? When we stop engaging, that's when we have a problem. Any parent in this room knows that when, when, a, when, when you have a child who's running toward you and crying, there's a lot of information coming at you in that moment, right? Um, as a dad, if my child is running toward me and they're crying, there's a couple of things that I notice. One, they're crying, so they're breathing. That's good. That's good. It's bad they're crying, it's bad, but they're breathing, so that's good, right? The other thing that's happened is they're actually moving. They're walking toward me. And don't let them be running toward me. I may ignore them completely. Right? Because that tells me that they're working. <laughs> their bodies are working. Their muscles and their neurons are firing, right? Because they're walking, they're moving, they're physically engaged with the world around them, with me. They're looking at me. They're crying out for me. Every parent's worst nightmare is to look at your child and they're silent and immobile. Now we got a problem. Now we got a problem. One of the scariest moments of my life, I'm sitting in my, my bedroom, and uh, one of my children had a fever, was sick. And so we knew he was sick. And we've been giving him Tylenol and everything. Um, but he walks into the room, he's engaged. He's not crying, um, but he's walking toward me. And then he stops. So now he's not moving anymore. He's not saying anything. He's kind of staring through me, right? He's kind of glazed. And then he collapses. Scariest moment of my life. I run over to him. I jump up, run over to him, grab him, put him in the car, rush to the emergency room. Um, as I was walking toward him, running toward him, he had begun to come to and make his way back to his feet. But what was so scary about that moment is that he stopped engaging me, the world around him, and he fell, silent, collapsed. It was a moment of lightheadedness. The fever got to him. He was fine, but it was a scary moment. The moment we stop engaging with God, the moment we stop actively setting our hope in him, is the moment we get stuck. Imagine that climber 
freezing on the mountain. Now he's got a problem because he's not moving. He's not climbing anymore. We got to engage with God. He wants to be getting you back up, even in the present, but that takes and requires us presently, actively engaging our hope and our faith in him. With every breath, he's getting me back, he's getting me back, he's getting me back, he's getting me back up. With every single breath you take, this is what it looks like to engage with God, setting our hope and our mind on him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then he will get, somebody say he will get. He will get you back up. Paul says, we went through everything we went through in Asia, and it was bad, but it was so that we would learn to rely not on ourselves, but on God. We now set our hope in him, but we need your help. He says, we need your help. Paul just went through everything he went through. Now he's writing to a group of people, a church that he planted, that he had a relationship with. He's the leader. He's the apostle, but he's saying, I need your help. Why? So that many, somebody say many, so that many would give thanks on our behalf because of you, because of your help, because of your prayers. How many of you know this Christian life is not meant to be lived in a silo? We can't do this alone. The many can't be reached by any single one of us. It's going to take many of us to reach many of them, whoever them are. And so he wants to get us back up to the level necessary in order to reach the many, in order to do much. But we can't do it alone. We need each other. We need each other's help. Three days later, a few days later, um, I go back to the house. Now, the contractor calls me. And, you know, he says, uh, he begins to list off all the things that, that he's done. He's like, yeah, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And I'm listening. I'm listening for the floor. Because the floor was what I was concerned about. And I'm listening for the floor, and he doesn't mention the floor. And I said, I knew it. My concern was valid, it was real, and it was a problem. You told me it was no problem, it's no problem, it's okay. He said, it's okay, it's no problem, don't worry. No, it's a problem because you didn't mention it. And so I get to the house, I'm driving to the house, and mad, I'm not mad actually. Um, and I wasn't driving like this either. The car. <laughs> car be all over the place while I was driving like that. But I get to the house, I go into the house, I walk down to the basement, I walk around the corner, I walk into the bathroom, and, and I see the floor, and it's done. It's finished. He didn't mention it. Not only is it finished, but it looks great. It looks great. But I know better, because I know that just because something looks good doesn't mean it is good. And I'm looking at the floor, and it looks good. And we live in a world and a culture where a lot of things look good. People, people's lives look really good on social media. But it's not until you begin to step on it, it's not, not until you begin to place pressure in one place or another that you can really tell what's what that you can really tell how solid one thing is versus another. And so I walk into the bathroom, I take one step. Now, if you remember, he had already laid a row of, of tile, right? Remember I mentioned that? So he laid a row, that row looked fine, I stepped on it, and it was fine, it was solid. And I said, well, this row was already there, that's fine. I didn't know what that floor looked like before anyway, right? So that floor is solid. Sometimes it takes more than just a check-in in somebody's life to tell whether it's solid or not. That was just one step. Felt solid, it was fine, right? Hey, how you doing? Good, great, God bless you. <laughs> Sometimes it takes more than just a check-in. Walking with people is hard, it's difficult. Actually taking step after step after step after step 
It's hard. It's hard work. This is what it looks like to help each other get back up. God wants to use us to help each other to get back up because there are many that need us to be that way. So I take another step, and it's solid. (laughs) It's solid. And I take another step, and it's solid. It's level. It's perfect. We all know what it feels like to walk into some place and you're, you're, you're looking for the dips. I'm looking for the dips. I remember the places on the floor that were imperfect. I remember all the slopes and the cracks and the crevices. I remember where they were, and I'm stepping on those places, and I can't feel a remnant of it. It's perfect. He didn't mention it because for him it was no problem. It's okay. It's no worry. He wasn't even worried about it, and now I see why. And so I'm walking around the floor. It looks great. It feels great. And in my mind, I'm thinking, man, how did he, how did he get this thing to feel so solid like it was? And, and, and mind you, tile, tile is, is not malleable. It's only about that thick, right? You lay a piece of tile like that, it stays like that. You lay it like that, it stays like that. And so the order, in order to make it level, what's under it needs to be level. Does that make sense? What's under it needs to be level. So now I started asking, well, man, what did, how did he get this thing to be like that? And I realized it was the mortar. It was the mortar. The mortar is what made the floor level. And so while the mortar is level on top, and the tile is placed on the mortar, and it's the tile that I see that looks beautiful, I realized that what's under that tile had to be level. I mean, you know, man, the job is great. You see somebody, you see that great job, you see the clothes, you see the car, you see this, you see that, but what's under it isn't always level. It's great to have the the things, it's great to have the job, it's great to have the car, it's great to have the bank, it's great to have this, it's great to have that, but, but what's under it better be level, because if not, that tile will crack. That job will crack. That relationship will crack if what's under it isn't level. And I realized that while the mortar was level on top, at the bottom, the cracks and the crevices were still there. The inadequacies were still there. All the imperfections were still there. But it was the mortar itself that was actually filling those gaps, that was filling those holes and filling those dips and filling those cracks and filling those crevices and filling that sorrow and filling that grief and filling that unforgiveness and feeling that pain, and feeling that sorrow. It was the mortar that was filling everything that we sometimes think disqualify us from following him. It was the mortar. How many of you know Jesus is the divine leveler of our lives? It's him. It's him. He himself provides himself as the mortar that makes us level. He's the mortar that brings us up to a new level. He gets us back up. That floor was down. Where it was down here, we needed it to be here. And the mortar did that. Man, there's scars. There's memories. There's pain. There's hurt. There's things that that we've experienced that indeed we think disqualify us from being more, from getting us back up. And so we stay there, we stay down. Paul said, we went through everything we went through so that we would learn to rely on God who raises the dead. God himself that raises us to a new level. He got us back up. He is getting us back up. He will get us back up. You know, the other thing that was interesting, noticeable, is that each one of those tiles 
before they were pressed down and joined in that mortar was singular. And they all looked they all looked fine. They looked okay by themselves as single pieces of tile. But man, when you put them all together and you got the mortar joining all of them and you got them cut just right and laid just right and they're symmetrical, now that's a good looking floor. <laughs> if we want to be a good looking people, we got to allow ourselves to be joined together by the mortar that is Christ himself. And guess what? Mortaring is dirty work. It's dirty work. Laying tile is dirty work. You can't do it and stay clean. Jesus was clean. And he was willing to come down into our mess into my mess, into your mess, into the messy parts of our lives, into the darkest places of our lives. For many of us, that's where he found us, in the dark places, the dirty places. He was actually willing to get dirty to fill those areas of your life. He was actually willing to get dirty to fill the cracks, to fill the voids, even on this Father's Day. Many of you experience the reality of voids on a day like this. I want you to hear those words this morning from your heavenly Father saying, get back up. And it's not just a directive. He himself is actually offering himself as a provision to fill those voids so that you can get back up. He's our mortar. He's our mortar. Apart from him, we can't get to the level that we need to be in order to do all that we need to do, in order to be all that we need to be. He wants to come into your life. He was willing to get dirty to do so. And now he's asking the question, what are you willing to do? He was willing to get dirty for you you willing to get dirty for him because we're all bricklayers we can all do it but it can get messy it can get dirty when we begin to lay Jesus in people's lives we can't do it without getting dirty he couldn't do it without getting dirty but he did it he made us clean in the process. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. On this Father's Day, on this Juneteenth, as we hear the words of a Heavenly Father encouraging us to get back up, as we remember our ancestors, who were given the right to get back up. Getting back up is hard. But he can do it. Only he can do it. So I'm inviting those of you this morning who realize that you need the divine mortar of Jesus in your life to fill the inadequacies, to fill the imperfections, to fill all the low places, the dark places, the places that you feel like have kept you so far from him. You know, his arm is not too short to save. 
There's no place he can't reach. There's no place he can't go. There's no crack that that mortar can't get at. He can do it. But you got to be willing to open up your life. You got to be willing to rely on him and not on yourself to get you back up. And so if that's you this morning and you realize that you need his mortar, you realize that you need him to fill those places, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you are the divine mortar of our lives. You level us. You bring us to a new level. You get us back up. Your word tells us that your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways, but as high as the heavens are, so are your thoughts above ours, so are your ways above ours. And so we need you to raise us to your level. We can't do it by ourselves. I thank you for everyone here who is inviting you into their lives to fill the low places, to fill the dark places, to fill the cracks, to fill the crevices, to turn mourning into joy, to turn unforgiveness to forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that even today you are providing yourself as fatherly provision. For those who have lacked a father, I thank you, Lord, that you are our heavenly father. Bless those who've accepted you this morning. I pray you would give them everything they need to follow you. In Jesus' name.